ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستقبله ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وسلم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته this morning talk with the lady taala um is really to address an issue that is a common misconception amongst many people in terms of how to properly understand customs traditions um in regards to in light of Islam and along with that the misconception of shirk the issue should not be when it comes to holidays when it comes to anything that is outside of the sharia the issue should never be in terms of what is customary what is to be the custom norm that's not the understanding you have to understand what's being transgressed here and that is the legislation of allah hu jalla wa ala so we titled this talk shirk is worse than murder and we're going to bring the proof and evidence that shirk is the greatest sin that can ever be committed and we're going to show that inshallah ta'ala as long as as well as we're going to show about how to properly understand customs and traditions because many people use this as an argument to celebrate or even extend some type of greetings to the kufar during their holiday seasons and i don't think we understand the implications how far and far and deep this go in regards to greeting and congratulating individuals upon their kufr um upon their disbelief and upon their shirk um upon their polytheism joint partners of Allah Azza wa Jalla it is not is very important that Muslims forget the fundamental principles Sheikh Uthaymin rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi he commented and he mentioned that when it comes to the issue of fiqh okay then what is understood is that linguistically the word fiqh in the arabic language it means to understand something to have a proper understanding of something hence for Allah jalla wa ala he alludes to this in surah to isra verse 44 Allah azza wa jalla surah isra surah 17 verse 44 Allah jalla wa ala says wala kan la tafqahuna tasbihahum tafqahun is from the word fiqh all right however you not understand their praises or their glorification so here the word fiqh mean understanding linguistically Another verse Allah Jalla wa Ala he mentions in Surah Al-Hud verse 91 Surah 11 verse 91 Allah Jalla wa Ala he says wa qalu ya shu'ayb so they said to shu'ayb the people shu'ayb they says ma nafqahu kathira mimma taqulun mimma taqulu we don't understand much of what you're saying so linguistically the word fiqh means to understand okay to comprehend something all right and comprehensions of different levels tayyib now then he says legislatively the word fiqh all right then it entails the rules understanding the rules and regulations in regards to creed and regards to actions of the servants all right and that fiqh in the legislation is not specifically restricted to the actions of the servants how the action how the servant behave what the servant can do in terms of what's permissible and impermissible fiqh is not just restricted to that Okay, you might say, brother, I thought you was going to talk about shirk is worse than murder. I thought you were going to talk about traditions. Why are you starting with this? It's important because many of us don't have the proper understanding of issues, and this is why we end up in the cases or circumstances we find ourselves in. This is why we can make a statement about celebrating or giving the customary greetings to people during their holidays. Really, is no big deal. This is why we can make statements like that, and I understand how seriously that statement in and of itself and what it entails this is how we can do that because we don't have proper fiqh we don't have proper understanding all right he said it's not restricted to just that he said rather it entails the rules and regulations to decree and to some of the point that some of the people of knowledge they said that in al-ilm aqidahu wal fiqh al akbar as it was attributed to the statement of abu hanifa he said that indeed the knowledge of aqidah which we call tawhid is the fiqh al akbar it is the greatest fiqh all right the greatest fiqh according to what imam abu hanifa and many other scholars they have said the greatest fiqh is what 
it is fiqh wa akbar is arqida all right and we're going to get into that wa had al haqqun and the sheikh says sheikh Uthameen comments on this he said this is the truth the greatest fiqh halal haram cannot even begin without aqidah okay henceforth you go back to the, the hadith of aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha what did she say she said have allah started with the do's and the don'ts the people wouldn't have done it but he started with the matter of the issues of aqidah first to what enter into their hearts because if you don't know who Allah is, you don't know who the one legislated it, you don't know who this, this, and that, your love for him and adoration, how are you going to follow his commands? How are you going to stay away from his prohibitions? Akita is very paramount. That comes first. You understand? That comes first. He says, Same point I'm making. The same exact point I'm making. He said, because a person cannot even begin to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The one who was worshiped, we can't worship him without what? After knowing Tawheed. Who did this worship go to? Exclusively, who do it supposed to be directed to? He can't notice. Without his rububiyya, he mentions the three aspects of that Tawheed. He says, He said, if not, if the person does not start with Aikida first and not start with Tawheed first, then his worship will be based upon ignorance and not upon knowledge. Do you understand? If you want your worship to be based upon knowledge, then it must start with Tawheed. You cannot escape this. All right? I wanted to bring that first before I go into the next point. Now, in the Quran, which is the Kitab of Tawheed, which is the book of Tawheed, Many people don't know, not just the book of Sheikh Muhammad Duwahab. Kitab al-Tawheed in the book of the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal, he mentions multiple times a list of things you should not do. And before he begin mentioning what you can do and what you cannot do, the very thing that he prohibits first, pay attention to. The very thing that he prohibits first, the first command that came in the Quran was the prohibition against shirk. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 20, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal nasu abudu rabbakum. O you who believe, I mean, O people, O mankind, worship your Lord. Right? Then he says in the next verse, Allah Jalla wa Ala, he says, فَلَا تَجَعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Do not join partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you know. Shirk is a crime against the Creator. Murder is a crime against creation. Do you understand the difference? It's not on the same level. It's not on the same level. There is no other crime that's on the same crime as shirk. Do you understand? There is no other thing that is worse than shirk. All right? That's important to understand because you might say, brother, why are you even bringing this issue up? Because if you're going to greet people on the holidays then you have to understand what is the underlining thing that you are giving them to celebrate and this 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 greeting that you're giving them what are you telling them it's okay to commit shirk do you understand what i'm saying that's what you're doing when you say okay i'm going to give you your greetings on your holidays i'm telling you it's okay for you to do that you can worship all, all, others along with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah jalla wa he says that the heavens and the earth and to Kadu Fatu, the heavens and the earth is getting ready to split because they have a joined son, a son to Allah Azza wa Jalla when he doesn't have. So think about that. Are we really thinking about this? We don't look at the implications behind everything. I'm not trying to get brownie points with my family because they are, you know, because I'm trying to keep some type of way. This is not no dawah that you you think you're doing. I'm trying to get some brownie point with my family. I'm trying to get brownie point with this person or that person, my coworkers or this or that, because I'm telling them, yeah, happy Hanukkah, happy Christmas, or, you know, good this and that. No, what are you talking about? Just let me know you have a deficiency in your understanding of it to me. Because it's not connected to just the legislation outside of that. It's not that. It's connected to the very core belief. It's a crime against the creator. And you don't even see it because you don't have fiqh. And it's a shame, man. Fundamental stuff that we should know. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, لا تجعلوا مع الله إله آخر Do not ascribe partners along with Allah Azza wa Jalla. He mentioned about 18 different injunctions and instructions but he begin with this verse here. And this is, by the way, this is in Surah 2 Isra, Surah 17. 
And then Allah Jalla wa Ala, He mentions وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا And that your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him إِلَّا إِيَّا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And to be dutiful to your parents until the end of this tremendous list of instructions. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jal says in another surah which is in Surah Tani He says, he says وَعَبُودُ اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْهَا Worship Allah Jalla wa Ala and join, join part, do not join partners with Allah. Then He mentioned another list of instructions. Another verse Allah Jalla wa Ala says in Surah An'am وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Recite unto them مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ That which your Lord has made impermissible for them أَلَّا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ بِاللَّهِ شَيْهَا And do not join any partners with Allah Azza wa Jal Before he mentioned killing Another verse in Surah Al-Furqan Allah Jalla wa Ala He mentions about the actions of Rahman أَلَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ لَاهٍ آخَرْ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَن Alright Allah Jalla wa Ala He mentions do not those who do not invoke on others along with Allah meaning commit shirk and they do not take a life unjustly right but before mention killing in this verse in Surah Al-Furqan he mentions shirk I want you, I'm trying to get you to, to follow along with me and understand there are many verses Allah mentions in Surah Al-A'raf um, Surah Al-A'raf which is Surah 7 Allah Jalla wa Ala he mentions um, Ku ma harrama rabbi Alaykum say, I'm going to recite unto you that which my Lord has made impermissible. And he mentioned the list of sins. And he mentioned shirk at the close to the end. And then after shirk, he mentioned wa Allah and takulu ala Allahi ma la ta'alamun. And that you speak about Allah that which you have no knowledge of. Ibn Uqayyim he derived from this that Allah mentioned the least first, then he mentioned the greatest. And then after shirk, he mentioned to speak about Allah without knowledge. And so he said, this shows that speaking about Allah without knowledge is worse than shirk. In a sense, because you're speaking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you look at any action that is actually done against Allah wa ta'ala, it contains ignorance in it. It contains jahl. Whether you understand it or not, this is why the famous companion Abdullah ibn Abbas who commented on a statement in Surah Al-Nisa, he says that what? Every person who commits a sin is jahil. It's ignorant, okay? Tight. Let's pay attention to this statement here. Sheikh Salih Fuzan, Allah, comment on this. He says, when, when Allah Azza wa Jal says, Atlu ma harrama rabbukum alaykum, recite unto them which the Lord has made impermissible upon them, upon you. Dala ala ana tahlilu haqqun li rububiyya. He said that this indicates that the permissibility of a thing, grant, saying something is permissible versus something being impermissible, is the right that's deserving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will be it. Meaning only Allah can legislate. He says, Because Allah is the only one who can make something permissible and permissible. Henceforth, Allah is the only one who can say what's a festivity and what's not. Do you understand? Allah is the only one who can legislate a festivity or not. Do you understand? And most festivities that people place, it is connected to some type of belief, and you don't even get it. It's connected to a belief system. You're saying that it's not. It is. Look at the festivities that are placed down. It's connected and associated with belief systems. It's why people do these celebrations that they do, and you don't understand the implication, the seriousness of this. All right? لا ما حرم حرم تموه أو حرمه أولياءكم من الشياطين من الإنس والجن كالأنعام التي يحرمونها يحرمونها للأصنام. He says, and it is not up to them to say what's impermissible, or up to their awliya that they take as their awliya, their leaders and their confidants and their protectors and their friends from amongst their leaders, to tell them from amongst the shayateen, from amongst men and from amongst jinn, that this is impermissible, like the cattle, right? One of the other names for Surah An'am, if you don't know, which is the sixth chapter in the Qur'an, is known as Surah Tawheed. Throughout An'am, Allah Jalla wa Ala clarifies and highlights Tawheed throughout the very, the very Surah, the whole entire Surah. And He clarifies the fight against Shirk via that Surah. Do you understand? So the, with the Kufar from the Mushrikeen, what they would do is they would say that certain cattle were not permissible due to the fact of their idols. Do you understand? He says, Allah tushri kubi He says here, then the law says, it begins with the gravest and the most serious of things that are impermissible. 
Allah says, Allah tushriku bihi shay'a, that you do not commit shirk with him in anything. So he said the gravest and the most dailyest and the most gravest, subhanAllah, uh, most gravest things that are the highest is shirk billahi subhanahu. Is committing shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then he says, if it is asked to you, someone comes to you and say, what is the gravest and the most worst sin that you can commit from the impermissible acts? Then you say to him, is committing shirk with Allah. If someone say to you, what is the gravest sin that you can commit? <laughs> that, that, what is the gravest thing which Allah has prohibited? Then you say to him that it is shirk billah. And if someone comes to you and say that, what is the most gravest things from those things which are munkarat, are evil and despicable? Then you say shirk billah. If someone say to you what is the gravest of the sins, the major sins that you can commit, then you will say shirk billah. I want you to pay attention to this. There is nothing that you're going to find on the scales that's going to be worse than shirk. And if you don't understand shirk, you don't understand tohi. Do you understand? If you don't understand shirk, you don't understand tohi. It's not possible that you can understand tohi and not understand shirk. Do you understand? You has, must understand it. The very thing that invalidates your tawheed is shirk. So you must understand that they go hand in hand. If you learn about tawheed, you must learn about the thing that invalidates it. You understand? That's how it works. You don't say, okay, I learned about tawheed and I don't learn about that with Allah. That's why Allah Jalla mentioned about all of those different things that invalidate tawheed. So he teach you about tawheed in the Quran, but then he also teach you about those things that invalidates it. So it's not you can say I know about Tawheed and you don't know about that which invalidates it. No, it don't work that way. He says here, this is as the Prophet ﷺ said, Akbaru Kabair or Shukr Billah. This hadith is collected by Bukhari and it's also collected by Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said the gravest of the major sins is as Shirk Billah. He says, So Shirk Waliyadu Billah wa Akhtar Dhunu. He said it's the gravest of sins. And it's the gravest sin which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be disobeyed with. And it is to worship along with Allah, someone other than Him. With directing any form or any type of worship to other than Allah. Now I want you to understand how deep this goes. Legislation, there is in shirk, one of the manifestations of shirk. It's called shirk of fitta'a. Do you understand this? It's called shirk of fitta'a. That's a manifestation in shirk. Do you understand that? Shirk in obedience, in legislation. Do you understand? The rabbis, what did Allah censor them? In the Quran, fi surah the Tawbah, what did he say? He said that what? That the rabbis and the priests, they have what? Prohibit for them, or they have made permissible for them that which their Lord has made impermissible. Adi ibn Hatim, the noble companion. He said, Ya Rasulullah, they don't do that. The Prophet said, yes, they do. Did they not make permissible what Allah made impermissible? Did they not make impermissible what Allah made permissible? By them doing that, they have taken them as lords. Allah says, Ittakadu. They have taken their ruhbana. They have taken their priests and they have taken their rabbis, their, their rabbis and, their, and, and, and their priests as lords besides Allah. So Adi said, no, they didn't. He said, yes, they did. By doing that, by accepting what they made permissible, only Allah can do that, and they made it impermissible, this is shirk fitta'a. Do you understand this now? Now you might say, where I'm going at with this? I'm going to show you. Christmas. All right? Christmas. Thanksgiving. I want you to pay attention. All of these different legislative festivities that have shirk steeped into it falls under what we call legislation. Number one, only Allah can legislate it. We just showed you the verse. Only Allah can make what's permissible, what's impermissible. Only Allah can legislate. That's number one. Number two, even with Allah legislating and not legislating, when a person actually goes against it, which is circulating around as shirk, which these festivities are, then what they're doing is actually they are what? They are contending with Allah's rule which you don't understand. They are contending with Allah's rule be it. Only he has the right to legislate. Only he has the right to make what's permissible and permissible. So when a person come along and say that it's permissible to participate in these holidays, that's contending with Allah's rule be it. And when a person come along and celebrate, which is lesser than that, as Ibn Qayyim said, even if it's not kufr, 
from the person who says Merry Christmas to someone else. Even if it's not kufr, at the very least, it's still a sin. And it's a grave sin. It's not something that's minor. Even if it's not kufr, we wouldn't say that the person who says Merry Christmas to another one, we're not going to say, okay, he's upon disbelief. But even so, he's still upon sin. It's not permissible. Ever, under no circumstances. And anyone who has thick of toheed and thick of shudder, they would know that they would not. Why would you say it? What purpose would you say it? Think about it. At what purpose would you say it? Why would you say it? It's not legislated. The things that are circulated with it. You know it. Even they know it themselves. The pagan holidays themselves. What they are actually associated with it. How are you going to try to bridge a gap? Talking about I want to be able to be formal and custom with my family. What are you talking about? If I tell you some of the stories of the Sahabas and how they were with their family, man, you, you don't even stand a chance. What are you talking about? How are you sympathizing with Kufr? I don't get it. This is the point that we don't understand. How are you sitting here sympathizing with Kufr and then you bringing out issues you don't understand nothing about? All right? I'm almost getting ready to stop. He says here, he says, he says that this prohibition is from Allah Azza wa Jalla in regards to committing shirk in any of his manifestations. And it is the gravest of that which your Lord has prohibited you from. And for Antum Tastahiluna Adam Muharramat wahua shirk. And if you are one who has made permissible the gravest of those things which are impermissible, which is shirk. And the kalimat, the word here, shay'an, the ulama, they says about it is an indefinite article, which the context of the prohibition makes it general. That it contains anything that is used or worshipped besides Allah. It doesn't matter if it's an angel, it doesn't matter if it's a prophet, it doesn't matter if it's a wali, it doesn't matter if it's a righteous person from the righteous people, it doesn't matter if it's a tree, it doesn't matter if it's a stone, it doesn't matter if it's someone in the grave, or other than that. It is a word that includes all of that. He says, "For here, kalimat to amma, yani ayu shayin min ashya ila yajuza in yusar for lahu shayin min ibadat Allah." Meaning that there is nothing from the things which people take as deities and worship is permissible for you to direct any of that from the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Also, what's included in it is that the different types of shirk falls under what we call major and minor. Some of the scholars, as Sheikh Sali Ali Sheikh goes in deep about this, some of the scholars, even though they use the verse, in Allah la la yakfiru an yushrika ma'ahum, la yushra bihi, wa yakfiru maduna dalik. And this verse in Surah Nisa, which comes twice in Surah, Surah Nisa, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Allah, indeed, Allah does not forgive that a person commits shirks along with him, but if you give anything lesser than that, some of the scholars they use as an argument that there is a such thing as major shirk and minor shirk. Sheikh Salah the Sheikh says, some scholars say, no, that there is no such thing as minor shirk. I have another best, that's a, a nice debate, um, scholarly debate amongst the scholars in regards to that. So here he says here that, فَلَيْسَ هُنَاكَ شَيْءٌ مِنَ الشِّرْكِ يُتَسَامَحْ فِيهِ لَا أَكْبَرَ وَلَا أَسْقَرْ لِيَنَ قُولُ تَعَالَى شَيْءٌ كَلِمَةُ عَمَّةً فِي جَمِيعُ الشِّرْكُ كَبِيرُهُ وَصَغِيرُهُ كَمَا أَنَّهَا تَمْنَعَ أَنْ يُشْرِكَ مَا اللَّهِ أَحَدَ كَائِنَ مَنْ كَانْ لَا مَلَائِكَةٌ مُقَرِّبُونَ وَلَا أَنْبِيَاءُ صَالِحُونَ وَلَا جَمَادَاتٌ وَلَا أَشْجَارُ وَلَا أَحْجَارُ وَلَا كُبُورُ وَلَا أَيُّ شَيْءٍ لَا يَجُودُ يَصْرَفُ شَيْءٌ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ غَيْرِ الْغَيْرِ وَلَا النُّذُورُ وَلَا الذَّبَاحِلُ وَلَا الطَّوَافُ وَلَا الدُّعَاءُ وَلَا الْخَوْفُ وَلَا الرَّجَاءُ وَلَا الرَّقْبَةُ وَلَا الرَّهْبَةُ لَا يَجُودُ ذَلِكَ سَوَاءً كَانَ الشِّرْكُ أَكْبَرَ الشِّرْكُ أَصْغَرَ سَوَاءً كَانَ الشِّرْكُ جَلِيًّا ظَاهِرًا الشِّرْكُ خَفِيًّا مِنَ الْقُلُوبِ And basically he was saying just pretty much what I was mentioning he was saying that it don't matter what shirk it is whether it's minor or major all of that is prohibited okay it doesn't mean because it is a minor shirk or a lesser shirk here that it doesn't hold the same grave prohibition shirk in and of itself is period no matter what it is and no matter if it entails dealing with an angel a jinn a person a stone a tree whatever any act of worship that is supposed to be directed to Allah Azza wa Jal, any of those things, dua, hope, desire, longing, fear, all of those things supposed to be exclusively given to Allah only. Do you understand that? So if a person makes that change and that possibility, he's going to make a failure. Bring me to my third part of this talk, inshallah, that brings it home for those who use the argument that saying the greetings is customary, okay? I want to mention something very fundamental that we must understand when it comes to Islam. Islam is based upon principles. If you don't learn the Qawaiid, you won't learn what to do, all right? You need principles to understand, and it's fundamental principles you must know, all right? One of those fundamental principles, especially when it comes to Masa'id, issues, because issues are divided, inshallah, as when we deal with fiqh, 
you're only going to have two aspects in this dean there's no third aspect there's no fifth there's no sixth. there's only two aspects to the dean do you understand this as Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh, he mentioned it's not from me. Sheikh Saleh Ali Sheikh explained this, that there's only two aspects to the deen. He says the deen is only going to be divided into Tawheed or to Halal and Haram. Do you understand? So Tawheed deals with that, a fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Halal and Haram deals with the Akam wa Amaliyah. It deals with those actions pertaining to, pertaining to the servants. Do you understand? Which we talk about Fiqh or Eskal. And Tawheed is Fiqh or Akbar. Do you understand? So when you look at fiqh in the different madhabs, when you don't understand what, what is that about and why madhabs are permissible to follow in the first place, it's because you don't understand that madhab is divided into two. You have what we call madhab al-shaqsiya and you have madhab al A lot of us don't understand this stuff. We don't know what it is. So the first thing we think is that all madhab is wrong. No, you're wrong. Allah used the word madhab in the Quran. The salaf has a madhab. The prophetic has a madhab. You don't understand that. But you don't know what it means. So you think that all shirk, all madhabs are wrong. You're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. There are permissible following the madhabs. You have to understand the difference between a madhab al-shaqsi and a madhab al-istilahi. You might not even know the terms I'm using. But you must understand these things. And this is why the scholar talks about them. Okay? A madhab al-shaqsi as a madhab is based on the personal views and opinion and actions of that particular person that the madhab is based upon. And a madhab al-istilahi is that which based off in a technical sense how the person did, meaning a school, a student, or some students who have took the understanding of that scholar pertaining to different acts of worship and things like that and have systematically laid down, that becomes that. It's not necessary that every person that had a madhab, and it was many madhab that dies off, it's not necessary that the person who had followed that madhab was actually of the opinion of what was taken down. Somebody took his understanding of how to apply and extract rulings from a certain text pertaining to a certain action and they made it a systematic thing. So that became a madhab. Do you understand? But my point of mentioning all of this is that Iman Ahmed, right? He mentioned a beautiful point. And this is a principle that we should work by. He said, do not take a position in the deen unless that you have an imam preceding you. Okay? Do not take a position, okay? Now, you have to understand, what is the position in the deen? What is to take a mokif in the deen? Do not take a stance that you argue for or deem to be validated, that it is that thing which is a part of the deen, no matter what aspect of the deen it is. Do not take a stance. And we're talking about fiqh here. Fiqh with Eskab. We're not talking about fiqh with Ekba. All right, but it can trickle over to fiqh with akbar as well, meaning you don't speak about Allah Jalla without no knowledge. So you have to have someone preceding you on that understanding, whether it's in tafsir, whether it's in um, the ahadith. You still have to have a shah, an explanation to it. Do you understand? So do not take a position you don't have no iman preceding you. It's not okay to pose a question because questions have etiquettes. It's not okay to pose a question to those who aren't worthy to answer the question. Henceforth, Allah Azza wa Jalla says in two places in this book, one is Surah Al-Nahl, Surah 16, and one is in Surah Al-Anbiya. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُمْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And he also says this verse in Surah Al-Qasas, and another way Allah Azza wa Jalla mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ should ask those who know, know the book. Tayyip. Allah says, Fas ahlu dhikri in kumtum la ta'alamun. Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. In the hadith of the man who actually had a wound, he was bleeding, right? And the companions told him not uh, to told him to go ahead and still make wudu over the wound. He wound up dying. And when the story reached the Prophet, Wasallam, he said, The cure for ignorance, the cure for he said, SubhanAllah, you have killed him, the cure for ignorance is axing. Okay? You don't pose your question to Facebook. You don't do that. And then you don't pose a question that is loaded, by the way, with your opinion and that you're adamant for, saying that no is a question that I don't really know. No, you know, because you're not taking anything that's coming along your way. You should not do that. You should come off in terms of asking the proper people in terms of that. And if you know, that you haven't studied any science or any field in Islam, you shouldn't be popping off. And to say something about Allah you do not know, you should not be popping off. That's the very definition of, 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 of jahl, of ignorance. Then you should know. Then you don't make 
comparisons of analysis based off some English text that you don't even have an understanding of, let alone principles that you don't even know. You're using things and you're saying that this is a Dalil. That's not a Dalil. Who told you that was a Dalil? It's Istidlal. It's a bab and fit. How do you know to use it as a Dalil? So to safeguard yourself is to go back to what Imam Ahmed said. Do not take a position unless you have an Imam that precedes you. So if that's the case, you haven't studied, then you go to somebody who's knowledgeable, who spoke about the issue, who actually brought their proofs and extracted their benefits from the issue, and then you work with that. Right? I give you a beautiful example. I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting ready to let this go. I give you a beautiful example. I remember one time Mufti was given a class, Muhammad Munir, that is, right? And he was going over the issue of praying and raising the hands. You see how the palms face out when we raise the hands? He says, Can you censor somebody if they was to raise their hands like this? He was saying, If somebody gets in the prayer and they do like this, Allahu Akbar, right? He says, Is this wrong to do like this? Is this wrong, right? So, you know, we, we was in there, we were saying, okay, of course it's wrong. He, would say, right, he said, so what's your proof that it's wrong that a person can't pray like this? Right? So when he said, what's your proof? He's talking about, give me something from the book of Allah, give me something from the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, that this is incorrect, that you cannot raise your hand like this. Right? And it's, it's a lesson in this. And he brought the proof that you're not going to find any clear, explicit text that's authentically attributed to the Prophet Wasallam that he says, do not raise your hand like this. All right? He says, you're not going to find one. But he said, it's suffice enough that we have a scholar who actually says that the palm should be raised out. And he said, that scholar was Ibn Al-Qayyim and he mentioned in Zad al -Ba'ad. So the, court, the good thoughts that we have about that particular scholar, the good thoughts that we have about that particular scholar is that that scholar is not going to make a statement without having some evidence that he has. He didn't mention his evidence, but we know that we have a statement from him mentioned that the palm should be outward and so that we have that. The point of me bringing this up is showing you that you should still have someone preceding you. So for you to use the argument that it is from culture and customarily, it's from customary greetings that you can greet someone. You're not celebrating their holiday by giving them a greeting. Then you have to have an imam that said that that's actually the case. And then when you have someone telling you that Ibn al-Qayyim and Ibn al-Taymiyyah comes behind and tell you that no, you can't greet them under no circumstances. Ibn al-Rajah brings the same point and the same argument. You can't greet them under no circumstances. It's not allowed. It's not this. It's not that. It's not this, that. And they say it's a consensus. A consensus. I mean consensus. I mean it's an ijma. And then they bring proofs because they use ayat to direct or in telling you where you cannot do it. And they mention those things. And you still come back and say, oh, this is not enough. This is not what I'm talking about. This is supposed to be this. It's supposed to be customary. Now, I'm going to give you something for that. How do we understand orf? Customs. Add that what orf. The word orf and the word customs. How do we understand that in Islam? So, so that you know, in Shara and legislatively, the word orf and ada, habits and customs are the same thing. All right? That means it is a tradition or a customary thing that a people of society actually lives by or goes by. How do we understand this in Islam? Okay. There are two conditions. First and foremost, I want you to understand. There are two conditions when dealing with orf, all right, and customs and add that, all right. And this issue falls under fiqh, all right. Not fiqh with akbar because that's still he. It falls under fiqh with eskal. Remember, it deals with the actions of the servant, right? So, it must conceal to, number one, it cannot oppose any clear legislative text. The custom, that customary practice, that habit that the society does, cannot oppose a clear Islamic text, all right? It cannot, that's number one. Number two, it also must be something that can be done, right? And it's not something that is actually contradiction. Whereas, if it's different, فَلَا تَكُونُ حُجَّةً وَتِبَعُ وَتِبَعُ All right? So it has to actually be something that's not contradicting. Okay? This is the rulings on what we call the two conditions that must be done. Customs and traditions, Right? that clearly go against the Sharia or which go against the general aims of the Sharia or which may lead to misunderstandings and shortcomings should be shunned 
and effort should be made to change them, which need some wisdom and gentleness. Sheikh Sa'id, Sheikh Sa'idi, Iman Sa'idi, Rahimahullah, he says in his book, which is called Risalat al-Usul al-Fiqh, he said the basic principle re with regards to customs, to urf, is that they are permissible. That's the basic principle. Unless, now here's the shab, the condition. It is narrated in the sharia that they are forbidding. Okay? So it is permissible outwardly unless, and remember the two conditions we mentioned before, it goes something in the text in the sharia narrated in that forbidden. It, okay? Sheikh Abdul Aziz ibn Ibas, Rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, says in Majmur Fatawa, what every Muslim must do is not accept customs blindly. Just because the society is doing it, just because it seems like a tradition from America, from anywhere, in any place that you're at, do not accept it blindly. Rather, he should measure them against the Sharia. Ah, what have I been saying in most of these talks? It's important to have knowledge before you do speech and actions. Weigh it against what is susceptible and what's not susceptible. Stop thinking because it's this or it's that. You don't understand the issue while follow it. Do you not understand that statement? Knowledge precedes speech and actions. You have to have knowledge before you do anything. Is it permissible? Is it not permissible? Can I do it? Can I not do it? Look how he's going to sum it up though. He's going to go further deeper than what I just did. He's going to go deeper than He says, whatever is approved of is permissible for him to do, otherwise he should not do it. The fact that people are accustomed to something is not evident. It is permissible. All the customs that people are used to in their lands or tribes must be measured and weighed against the book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whatever Allah and His Messenger have permitted is permissible. And whatever Allah has forbidden is must be abandoned, even if it is the people customs. See how deep he went? So now, not just getting caught up and following any tradition blindly because the society is doing it, we have to weigh it against the book and the Sunnah. And whatever Allah and His Messenger consider to be good, we're going to take. And whatever does not, we're not going to take. Now the issue here, we're talking about holidays. You can't say it's a customary thing because traditionally every year people celebrate these holidays. No, this holiday is connected with something that is forbidden. Number one, it's the holiday sanctioned by Allah. What is the condition about customary customaries? What we just talked about. What did we just say? The first condition is cannot oppose what? A clear legislative text. Is the holiday permissible and sanctioned by Allah and the Sharia? If the answer is no, right? Then how can you follow the custom of saying, I'm just giving an actual greeting? The holiday itself isn't permissible. How can you swindle in there that I'm trying to bridge the gap between me and my family members or me and my co-workers or me and my this how can you bridge that gap there is no bridging the gap in something that's impermissible you understand and the fact that i feel even more it's crazy because you should have been thinking in your heart that this is a crime against allah not humanity against allah it's shirk that in the very essence of that you wasn't going to deal with it you understand i give you another scenario shikr demean he brings a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu had took a man A man, one of the companions had a gold ring on his hand The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi um, Took the gold ring Snatched it off the companion's hand Threw it in the ground, threw it down And said that rally this is in the fire So the other companion He came up to the man, he said Won't you just pick it up and sell it Can't wear it, it's not permissible So won't you just benefit and sell it you know, get something off. The companion that the ring was taken off his hands, he said, SubhanAllah, he said, I will never pick up nothing that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited. I'm going to let that sit in there for a minute. All right? So think about this. The concept, again, is that we must take whatever is permissible, deemed by Allah and this Messenger to be permissible, and we must accept that. And we must take that which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala deemed and His Messenger deems impermissible, and we must stay clear of it. If we find ourselves trying to find loopholes around it, then it's safe to say we are following our desires. And it's a dangerous path to lead down because what's going to happen is you're going to start making excuses for everything. 
and then you're going to start overlooking things that are major components which can lead you to cover because you don't want to have a proper understanding of what's right and what's wrong and this go all back again to your thick and your call and the connection of Tawheed versus Shirk because that's what holidays is about it is steeped in Shirk so it's an issue that deals with that and it deals with Allah who will be as far as his legislation we talked about that halal wa haram do you understand? this is important look at it I'm not done he's, he's going to sit here Shaykh Rathameen Rahmatullah Ta'ala Alayhi he says traditions does not make something that is not prescribed permissible prescribed holidays are they prescribed by Allah? are they I don't care if it was a 20 years, 30 years I live in a society and every year they would do the same exact thing. It does not make it permissible because it's not prescribed. Who prescribed it? Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum usliyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. Oh you who believe, fasting has been kutiba, has been prescribed has been decreed for you as it was prescribed for those who came before you. Kutiba, it has been prescribed, meaning that the Lord himself prescribed that very particular thing. Not you, not me, not someone from the creation, not society, anything. What? It has been prescribed. Do you understand this? Does it make something that's not prescribed permissible? Because Allah Jalla says, it is not al-bir. Now pay attention to this. Lays al-bir. It is not al-bir. And tatul buyuta min abawabiha. I mean, min a min zahoriha. As Allah says in Surah Baqarah, it's not permissible that you enter the doors. It's not not permissible. It's not righteousness. It's not considered piety and righteousness that you enter the doors from the back, not from the front, but you enter the doors, the houses from the back. They enter the houses or the homes from the back. Right? Pay attention now. Even though that was their custom. And they regarded it as righteousness. So during the time of the Prophet people thought that it was righteousness to go into the houses from the back way and not from the front. That was a custom that they had. But Allah sent down the verse, لَيْسَ birra أَن تَأْتُوا الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهَا It's not permissible to enter the homes from the back. Alright? It's not righteousness to enter the homes from the back. So what does this verse clarify to us? That even though that was your customs, it go against the clear text. We're going to follow the text. Allah says, what? He says, what tul buyuta min abawabiha, but into the houses from their proper doors. Okay? He said, the one who takes something as a custom and regards it as righteous has to measure it against the laws of Allah. That's number one. Let's go back again. Is the holiday sanctioned and prescribed by Allah? That ends all arguments. You don't have to come and say, is it a customary greeting? We can't even have that discussion. Number one, is the holiday permissible or not? That's the question. And if the question, if it's not permissible, everything associated to it, it's not permissible. Do you understand that? Everything associated around it becomes not permissible. Do you understand that? So you can't say, okay, the holiday is this, this, that. You can't use that argument. I'm not greeting, I don't believe that this, this, and that. And we had a guy, I don't know his name, Sheikh Azar or something like that. Somebody posted up on the timeline that he was saying that it's got nothing to do with belief systems. You can give them a Merry Christmas. You can say Happy Hanaluka, Hananuka, whatever like that. You can give them all that. No, you're Balton. A person who's saying that he's a scholar and he's telling you that you can do this, Balton. It's Balton. Because even if I didn't have 100 proofs or 100 texts, I'm going to ask one question. Is the holiday permissible or not? That's my question. And if you tell me that it's not permissible, then how can you tell me it's okay that I give the greetings? I'll wait. How can it be okay? Allah says, Wala taqrabu zina. He did not say, Wala taf'alu zina. He did not say, Do not do zina. He says, Do not come close. Do not approach the means, which becomes a fiqh ruler now, that the ulama mentioned. Do not approach the means that leads to the way. Huh? Right? How can I do that? No, we cannot do that, man. Happy Kwanzaa, happy all that, man. Stop that stuff, man. Prophet ﷺ ordered us to be different in all things. That's even in our beards. That's even in trimming our mustaches. That's even in the way we wear our garments. That's even our pants above our ankles. To be different in everything. You come along and say, no, I want to be sympathetic. Henceforth, we got the people with the interfaith dialogue. What are you talking about? The Quran never once suggested to do interfaith dialogue. Show me one ayat where Allah subhanahu wa told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to open up an interfaith dialogue with him. I just read to you the other day, Allah jalla wa ala opened what we call the mubahala. 
Bring your sons, bring yourselves, bring your wives, bring your family, and let's invoke the curse of Allah Jalla wa Ala if what you're saying is to be true or not. That's what he said, dude. He didn't say open an interfaith dialogue. Like we just sympathetic, man. Let's open an interfaith dialogue because we got to come to a common ground. We got to, you know, we all fellow humans. What are you talking about? It is Tawheed versus shirk, man. Do you not understand that? That's what is clear. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Allah ladi khalaqakum. Allah is the one who created you from amongst you are those who are believers and from amongst you are those who are disbelievers. There is a separation whether you understand it or not. Stop trying to see sympathetic, man. Don't know where we get this concept from. Last but not least, he says the, 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 the scholars regarded adherence to customs, traditions that cause hardship for people and lead to some evil consequences or hardship and disputes and difficulty as blameworthy extremism. Pay attention now. And as a kind of an affectation, pay attention, and going to extremes that is forbidden in Islam. So people who use these arguments, this is basically what he's saying. People who are sympathetic towards these things, they develop an affectation, an affection, and they are actually upon a form of extremity and trying to adhere to these customs and traditions, even over texts. So extremism is to go excessive, to go beyond. This is excessive. The holiday is impermissible. The things that circulate around the holiday is shirk, and we know this, but yet and still, I'm gonna go beyond that to bridge the gap between me and my family members. You get what I'm saying? I'm gonna go beyond that. It's extreme. You see how deep that can go? It, it becomes extremism. And then I'm gonna use proofs that I don't even understand whether I can use them as proofs or not. I'm gonna go get a hadith here. I'm going to get something here from a scholar and then I'm going to try to mix and mush it all together so I can follow my desires. Right? Those who go extreme, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, who is reported to have said, those who go extremes are doomed. And he said it three times. This is collected by Muslim. Abdullah, the noble Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he says that those who practice gulu, they are doomed. They are destructive. As Allah says, Ya ahl al kitab la taklu fi dinikum. Allah says in Surah Ma'idah, O people of the book, the Jews and Christians, do not go excessive, do not be extreme in your deen. La taklu fi dinikum. The Prophet told the people that said the three men, he says, What? Whoever turns away from my sunnah, falaysa minni is not of me. Do not go extreme. Be upon a middle course. Be moderate. Even Nawawi, Rahim Allah, he says in his explanation of Shah Muslim, he said, Those who go extreme and exaggerate in their words and deeds. Either in their words and their deeds. Shaykh Rathaymini ends this here, and that's where we ended with this. He said the fourth category is going to extreme in customs, which is adhering too strongly to ancient customs. It's not Christian, it's an ancient custom. An ancient custom. Henceforth, a person come argue. Well, this is what they do every year. What's wrong with me telling them Merry Christmas? What's wrong with me saying Happy New Year? What's wrong with me saying Happy Thanksgiving? What is wrong with Valentine's Day? I mean, what's wrong? I know it's not permissible in our dean. I don't practice it. I don't go home and, and, and do it. I don't participate in it. But I want to give my fellow mankind, how you doing? Cheering you on. This is what I want to do. This is my argument. <laughs> Extreme and anxious customs, right? Not turning to that which is better than that. But if the customs are equal to others and serving a valid purpose, then adhering to one's own custom is better than turning to foreign customs. And Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best at the end of that tremendous statement. This is important. And it's not about having suspicions of someone. A statement is a statement. You can't be suspicious over a statement. If an individual makes a statement flat out that is haram and associating to something that's haram, you're only basing them, as Umar ibn Khattab said, we judge people upon what's his dawahir, which is appearance. If an individual make a statement, I have the right to ask the person, what do you intend by your statement? So if I ask you what you intend by your statement, and you come back with this or this or that, I'm not being suspicious because I'm asking you directly, what are you intending by your statement? We cannot, under no circumstances, go outside and think that it's okay that you don't understand what this is all about. I'm only adamant about this because what it's really about, if anyone think about it, it's really about shirk and tawheed. That's what it's about. It's not about Christmas. This issue is not about Christmas. You still think I'm, think I'm stuck on Christmas. You're wrong. This is not about Christmas. This is about Tawheed and Shirk. Do you understand? That's what this is about. What your Lord sanction is connected to the Wabiya, his legislation, Halal and Haram. That still ties in with some belief. It's about that. So what happens is when we become sympathetic, and that's why we got trees in our houses, Billah. That's why the Prophet made it clear. He says, you're going to follow the people 
who came before you, so much so, if that one of them enter a lizard hole, you're going to enter a lizard hole. If one of them have sex with their mother, you're going to have sex with their mother. Why do you think that this happened? Because people, what they do is they become sympathetic. They stick away from those things that make the tafriq, the distinction. They make and blur the lines. And because you're not sticking to those things, you're going to follow those people and everything. And then you're going to wind up wondering why you're so sympathetic with your dean. How many people were strong and adhering to their dean? And also, the flip side of that is to be aware of streamers. I'm going to leave you with this beautiful advice. Many of us have to stop. You're not upon righteousness if you think you have to do deeds a certain way. If those deeds are not measured by the Quran and the Sunnah, how the Prophet ﷺ did, Aisha made it clear, our mother, what did she say? It was never two things that the Prophet ﷺ decided between, except that he picked the easiest of the two. This is the prophetic guidance. Sticking to the middle course. Jabril told him, love whom you're going to love, but love him moderately. For one day you might hate to hate him. Hate who you're going to hate, but hate them moderately. Because one day you might have to love them. All right? Moderation is key. We go extreme from any two sides. Whether we get too lackadaisical, hence we become mutasahil. We become sympathetic. We start doing interfaith dialogue. We start giving a Merry Christmas, saying that it's custom greetings. We start doing stuff like that. Or we go to the other extreme, whereas though if we're not rigid, if we're not this way, if we're not that, then our ibadah is not accepted. And then you go off. You can't uphold that. This is the point you need to understand. You cannot uphold that. The Prophet ﷺ said, if, if I knew it wasn't going to be a shakka, a difficulty upon my ummah, I would have them brush their teeth every time they make wudu. You will not be able to uphold it. Do you not understand? It's an encouragement to do it, but you'll not be able to uphold it. A man kept asking the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, what if I do this? What is Allah? Do we have to do hajj every year? What is it? He said, have I said yes? Then you would have to do hajj every year and you would not be able to do it. Extremism. A moderate course. Allah is not wanting multiple quantity from you. He just want quality from you. Effort, juhd, that's what he want. How do we not understand what Islam is for? Islam is, is for you to utilize it, man. It's not for you to just sit around and take it as a, a whip and smack so-and-so up in the head and smack so-and-so up in the head. That's not what it is. Sheikh Salih Fuzan, what did he say? He said that the hypocrites, they use their proofs by hardening ayats and, 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 and ahadiths at one another. This is what they do. They try to throw proofs and evidence at one another, beating someone up in the head. That's not what we do. You're going to utilize the deen to help you in your very life. So you have to be moderate. You have to be balanced out. And that's the point I want us to understand. And your balance can only can be based off the balance of that of the Prophet and the companions. That's how you have to do. Well, we have prayed one rakat for a year straight. He didn't do nine. He didn't do eleven. He didn't do seven. He didn't do five. He did one. A year. When he was asked about it, he said, I was accustomed my soul to get used to the very thing of doing it. Did that make him anything less because he did one rakat poses to a person who do 11? The Prophet ﷺ said what? In Sahih Bukhari in the Book of Wudu, don't be like so-and-so who prayed the night prayer one night, two nights, but the third night he doesn't come out. Why? Because he overburdened himself. He overwhelmed. He went extreme. He didn't understand what he's supposed to do. No moderation. Do you understand? It's important. You're not super Salafi because you stream at the top of your lungs you hate bidah. That's not that. You want to hate bidah? Then start by the very thing of shunning holidays. Shun the holidays. Don't give no greetings or nothing. You really want to say you want to be a person who actually stay away from certain things? Stay away from things which Allah Jalla wa is displeased from. That's how you begin your request and your bark upon that which is right. Do that which Allah subhanahu wa love. That's how you do it. You don't have to be at the top of the lungs. Stay away from so-and-so. Stay away from so-and-so. No, all you got to do is stick to what Allah is what I'll tell you to do. In the Prophet That's what I wanted to bring today, inshallah ta'ala. Shirt, no doubt, is worse than murder. We have to really understand you cannot learn Tawheed unless you know the opposite. You cannot learn Shirk unless you learn Tawheed. And that we have to realize that customary Greece, that they have conditions. The first condition is cannot oppose a legislative, um, it cannot oppose a legislative text. All right, so if anyone come to you telling you that any of these holidays is okay, only thing you have to ask them first and foremost, is it permissible from Allah? And if they tell you that no, it's not permissible, or if they tell you that this is the kufar and that we are the Muslims, this is the non-believers, and this is what they have, this is their celebrations, this is what they have, if they tell you that and try to separate it, then they have a misunderstanding. Because since when did Allah Jalla separated the non-believers from the believers? He only separated them in certain things, but he still made the address the same. Ya ayyuhal nas. He didn't say Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. The first commandment that comes in the Quran, he did not say Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. Oh, you who believe. 
worship Allah. He says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, worship Allah. He says it again, Ya ayyuhan nas, attaqo rabbakum, O people, and fear your Lord. You see what I'm saying? So that means he addressed everyone. He didn't separate it and didn't address this person. Worship is for them just as well as for us. They chose not to follow it, then that's something they're going to have to answer with their Lord. But we still, they are still under the kitab. So we need to stop separating that. If a person come to you and tell you it's customary for them to say greetings, you tell them, brother, no, you're wrong. The holidays are impermissible in and of themselves. How do you know is they impermissible? Because Allah did not sanction it. I don't have one hadith, I don't have one ayat that Allah told me that I can celebrate Christmas, Thanksgiving, Valentine's, Father's Days, Mother's Days, any holiday they can come up with. He didn't tell me I can do it. So that number one let me know since he didn't sanction it, everything that's associated with it, I cannot actually agree. I'm not going to cheer nobody on. I'm not going to say this. And you don't have to be apologetic. You don't have to come out and say, um, well, I don't have to, um, I got to respect the people. I don't have to be rude to the people. We already know that. That's from our character. We're not going to, Allah said, well, that's a We don't, we don't, supu la ladini yada ulama mandunillah. Don't uh, insult those who are worship other besides Allah, Azza wa Jalla. We already know that. I don't have to come out and tell you that no, I'm not going to be rude. I don't have to be rude to a non believer because he's celebrating Christmas. I'm not going to do that. You don't have to tell me that you're not going to do that. I'm not doing that. By me sticking to the very guns that I have to both stick to, I'm not being rude to them. You know what I'm saying? So and you don't have to be like that. Just try to be more understanding in the sense of your deen, not understanding of others. You understand? Understanding of your deen because the deen is fear in and of itself. It's just in and of itself. It's going to be compassionate in and of itself. It's not mean or rude in and of itself. So if you stick to that, you don't have to worry about in insulting somebody else. You're not going to insult a person if you don't listen, follow what they're upon. They're actually going to respect you more. Really? And it gives you the opportunity for them to ask questions, which open the door of dawah, the very same thing that you keep trying to use. I want to give them a customary greeting for dawah, right? It opens the door for dawah. It opens. You get an inquisitive family member, you get an inquisitive friend or, 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 or um, a co-worker or a neighbor. They might say to you, oh yeah, I really want to know why, why don't you celebrate Christmas? And that becomes an open dialogue for you now to teach and educate. Do you understand? But yet you don't want to take that dialogue. You can't even begin that. You know what I'm saying? So that's the real thing that becomes with it, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us firm upon tawheed and to stay away from as shirk. We ask Allah Jalla wa ala to allow us to be people who are muwahidun and to stay away from the people who are mushrikun. And we ask Allah Jalla wa ala to allow us to stay away from all holidays that are in sanction by Allah Jalla wa ala. And if you really want killing to stop, if you really want killing to stop, People keep saying killing. It all starts back again with the heart and the limbs will follow. Allah did not start with the do's and don't, as Aisha Radha Anna so eloquently put it. She did not start with the do's and don't. He did not say don't kill, don't steal, don't do this. He started with the matters of the heart first. People have to love their creator. Morality have to be there. Do you understand? That's what we start with first and that's how we can stop people from killing each other and doing X, Y, and Z. But stop acting like you don't know that the hadith is clear. The Prophet ﷺ said that the signs of the hour is going to be kept to harj. There's going to be abundance of killing. That have to take place, bro. Do you understand that? People are going to kill senselessly because they don't have no spirituality with them. People are walking around alive physically, but they are dead spiritually. They don't have no understanding. So there's no moral code for them to work by. Do you understand? So they don't regard life as anything. They will take it. I don't need to worry about that. Yes, I'm going to stand up against holidays. Holidays to me is worse than, than killing it. Celebrating holidays to me is worse than killing. Why is it that? Because shirk is worse than murder. Holidays are steeped in shirk. It's worse than murder. So holidays to me is worse than killing. So yes, I'm going to stand up against holidays. If you, any holiday you participate in, I'm going to stand up against. If it's your birthday, I'm going to stand up against. Why? Because it is a legislation which Allah has not legislated. And it's that very same thinking that you have let me know that your morality is actually crisscrossed. That you're not going to even regard life. Why would you regard life if you can't even regard the every single thing that your creator sanctioned something that and, and unsanctioned something? Do you understand? So we have to stop this stuff, man. Seriously, man. Stop following our own desires and really get back to the deen and the sunnah.